So even though I feel like crap, we got to get this done because our, our deadline is April 1st. That way we have a month here to be tourists since we've been here all this time, but just working like dogs. Okay, we're going to be mounting our faucet in the sink right now. First, it gives you a place that you can draw and mark stuff. And then the second thing is, if there's any filings or anything goes away, it's not going to scratch the surface because the tape's there to protect it. So by putting the tape, especially in this case, the midline is where these two pieces of tape overlap. So it's really easy to get that centered as well. taking a little piece of the Azores with us everywhere we go in the form of our non-skid paint. So I picked up some crushed volcanic rock because that is apparently what the locals use as the non-skid agent in their paint. So to make our own non-skid, we're using volcanic, crushed volcanic rock from the island. I'm gonna mix that in with the paint and then we just roll it on. So in the past I've used the product from Interlux itself called Inner Grip and that's what we had for seven years. Uh, but they don't sell that here, so here everyone uses volcanic rock. Gonna mix it in so it's always in suspension with the paint, and then we just put it on. So there's a couple ways of putting on your non-skid. One is you paint the deck while it's wet, you then sprinkle it on and then let it dry, vacuum up the excess, and then paint on another coat of just paint. Uh, the nice thing with that is you can control exactly where you want your non-skid and how thick you want it. The problem is a lot of times you end up with like this zigzag pattern when you're going from salt shaker like that. So I've always done it the other way where you mix your non-skid into the paint and then paint it all on at once. And that's what we're doing. But uh, this volcanic rock is a little, uh, tricky to judge how much grit we need. Like, I've never used it before, and I really have no guidelines, so I'm just kind of trying it. So hopefully one coat's enough, and it's not going to tear our feet up for the rest of our lives, and I have no idea how easily this sands off in the future. <laughs> Great. Yep. <laughs> All right, the deck is non-skidded, I guess. We got the paint finished for the deck, so got all the non-skid done. Just gonna let this dry, and then after that, we'll peel up the tape. And then we're gonna go back, and any spots that like, you know, you still see a little gray primer through or stuff like that, we'll just hit them with a real thin coat of paint. Nothing too thick, because we don't want to create like lumps or drips or runs or anything. non-skid paint had a full night to dry. Uh, it's still just a smidge tacky, but I'm able to step on it, so that's the important part. And I must say, it is very grippy, and thankfully it doesn't feel like it's chewing up my feet either, so that's, that's good. The one from Interlux, that stuff, it binds in with the paint, and that stuff was still non-skid about seven years later, except in one spot where when we lived aboard in the marina, and we're in and out and always like pivoting on that spot with our shoes. That got worn down, but it was still somewhat non-skid. Seven years later, so that's, that's impressive. This stuff, I think we might get a year, maybe two years out of it, and it's just gonna rub down, and the stones will just chip out of the paint. So, we'll see. Right now, I am test fitting our new rack on the deck. Now, this rack originally started as a dinghy rack for two, three. <laughs> 
Two three is no longer with us. He is just hanging out in the Bahamas somewhere. But in our crossing, we found that having this rack was just so useful for a bunch of reasons. The first reason is our trisole comes down and it lives on this track. And we found that we were able to like ball it up here and then tie it to the front of the rack and kind of like stuff it in. And it kept it always at the ready, but not, not in the way and it wouldn't fly away or, or it was such little hassle to get that sail deployed. So we, we really liked having the rack for that. The second huge, huge thing that like I, it made the rack uh, a mandatory thing, not an optional thing, was it's a seat for me. So when we're reefing, uh, I have to stand up here because I need to get to the clue winch, which is on the boom. And the problem is I'll be up here on the deck when it's not lovely and I'd rather not be up here on the deck. And you have this nice big area that's all like smooth, but remember that this is level and when you're actually reefing in a storm, you're like heeled over really far, so. I used to look out at like this big gap here between the boom and the deck and I always felt like I was just gonna like fall through it. So it just, it didn't feel as secure to me. When we had the rack, I would sit in the rack and like hook my legs into it and I felt so safe. So I, I'd just sit here and work and get that reef put in. The boom was above my head the whole time. Like it was, I was fine with it. The rack has, you know, enough width to the legs for strength, but then where I sit and I'm gonna be hooking myself into, I got me a nice wide seat. That way it'll be nice and cozy. to the Euro store to see if they have a couple accessories that we need for our kitchen. And I'm taking the beautiful way. Weak knees and fresh scars. It's a struggle when you're losing track of who you are. The words you stole won't save your soul. They can only buy you. was I using a hacksaw instead of a wood saw to cut wood? And the answer is really simple. That mahogany is more like metal than it is like wood. It just, I can't cut it with a handsaw. It just won't go. And with a hacksaw, it's still a lot of work. It's like cutting through stainless. And then the other benefit of a hacksaw is because there's a much smaller kerf and the teeth are a lot closer together. It gives a much finer cut, so the end result's also smoother looking. Now in order to actually mount it to the deck, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut strips that are gonna screw into the base of the foot and then lag bolt into the deck. put the gravel grit non-skid stuff down and it just looks like crap like it looks so bad so I'm scratching it off when we fly back to the states in a bunch of weeks 
We'll pick up a pot of the, the real non-skid material, and then when we come back to the boat in May, we'll just put that on real fast, and then we'll keep going. Because this is just, this is ugly. This is not gonna go. Well, Herbie is working outside, I'm working inside, trying to make this place more livable, and uh, some exciting stuff is happening. I had to do all of our dishes um, because they got sawdust all over them in the process, and so now I'm going to put them into our new uh, silverware drawer. Straight. gotten the boat structurally and aesthetically done now it's time to start working on the electronic aspect of this all and being how we have an electric motor that's pretty much like the whole mechanical side of our boat so the issue we're having is or the issues we're having are a couple things one our batteries are all dead and two our chargers seem to be dead so we pretty much just have nothing uh, we're just a float or we're just a standing hole at this moment. So the house bank, it's a 48 volt battery system and it, it just, it's not holding any charge. Uh, I turned on the battery chargers, got stuff rolling, all that's good. And then when I, uh, you know, put, literally just turned on the motor, not had it running, but just in standby, the voltage would just drop from like 50 volts straight down to 30. So those batteries are toast. The house bank is the same thing. We run the battery charger for hours. As soon as the battery charger's off, the voltage is down to like 10 or 11 volts. So they're, they're all done. But the issue we're having is 
uh, so our two battery chargers, one cannot work on 220, only 110. So that one we would normally run hooked onto the generator, but it's dead. The other one uh, viewer sent us, uh, Alan, thank you very much. It's currently our only working battery charger, sort of. Uh, so it runs 110 or 220, so that's that's good. Except that when we plug it in, it does this. So we have no battery charger. Anyway, our electric battery charger is a toast, and then our solar panels have been dead for like ever. Uh, we currently have one 50 watt panel that works, but where we are, we only get sun for a couple hours a day. So pretty much no, no charging is happening. Now we do have new solar panels on their way, and they're gonna be much, much bigger. So currently we have 250 watt panels on our stern, and then we had 200 watt panels on the deck, giving us a total of 300 watts. The ones on the deck died because they were under salt water most of the trip, and then the ones on the transom, one died. Uh, in the storm off Hatteras, the little plate that like seals it all up cracked open, uh, and it just corroded to death. And then the other one still works. The new panels we're getting are 150 watts each, so that'll give us 300 watts just on the transom. And then, or on the stern, and then we have spare flexible panels that we have no idea if they actually work or not, but we'll put them on the deck, and if they work, that'll give us 500 watts total, otherwise we'll be down to just 300, which is still, like, where we were at our peak. The batteries died for a couple reasons. One is we've been very abusive to them. Uh, you're not supposed to take an AGM battery below 40% charge. <laughs> In the ICW, there were multiple times when we went to zero. They've had a really hard life the past two years and they're four years old. Then we've been here on the hard for almost a year. I mean, we got here in August and now it's March, late March. There's been no solar charge, nothing at all. These batteries have just been sitting in a boat, locked up, just discharging. And then the house bank, uh, I screwed up on that one, so I, left uh, one of the bilge pumps on, that way in case the boat filled up with rain during one of these storms during the winter, the bilge pump would pump it out. The problem is this is the, the automatic bilge pumps from Rule, where every like two minutes or so, it just meow, goes for a moment. And it's probably that thing that you guys have heard a lot in the backgrounds of our videos where it's just meow, meow, all the time. Now every time it goes, it draws a little power, and a little power, and a little power. And you do that for a year, with no charging, and you have completely dead house batteries. We've been in contact with a bunch of different companies. We'd love to go lithium. It's just way too expensive. It's, it's out of our budget. So we're looking at replacing our batteries with AGM again, and then in the future, you know, save up, and that'd be one of our, our goals to do in the future is to switch to, AG, to, to lithium. But in the meantime, you know, we're not at the point where we can afford lithium batteries and we need batteries now, so we're gonna get some local AGMs. Yeah. I'm really just nervous about coming down. You just lift me. Lift me. Oh. Just... <laughs> oh. Oh. Wow. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And if you'd like to follow our journey in real time on a map, receive postcards from our ports of call, and message us directly to the boat, you can go ahead and become a patron using the link in the description down below.